Okay, welcome to session 5.8. Uh, I'm going to give a kind of um, taste of uh, what's going on in the Poole and Rosenthal nominate score. So I think I'm going to do this in two videos, uh, uh, 5.8, 5.9. Uh, what I'm going to first do is just give some of a broad overview, kind of verbally state what's going on with um, the nominate scores. Um <clears throat> First thing to know, okay, well, Poole and Rosenthal created, which I think is the greatest achievement ever in uh, political science, and I think you have my reading uh, from my book, um, From Left Turn, there's a few pages where I describe what's going on with, with nominate scores, and I, I mentioned that, that I think it's the greatest achievement ever in political science. Um what most people use these scores for is they use them as a measure of ideology. So we'll talk about the nominate scores of, of different legislators. And uh, usually people will talk about the first dimension nominate score. And this is a number uh, usually between negative one and one. And I'm almost certain I have this right, that um, higher scores indicate more conservative. So, um, so um, I imagine if we look at the, the now, the, um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I can't remember her name, uh, we'll have something like a negative one, and um, Ted Cruz is going to have a positive one. Um, um, now, not only that, um, they also estimate cut points on bills so it's basically says where you know where's the point that the 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 um ideal point that would make a person indifferent or what score would make a person indifferent between voting yay and nay on a certain bill we call that a cut point um another thing the uh, scores sometimes people will talk about the second dimensional nominate scores and with all of these, it, it's it's not quite crystal clear how we should interpret what these scores are. I told you that the first, um, the, the the on the first dimension, we interpret the the score as a measure of how liberal or conservative someone is. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, uh, Poole and Rosenthal do not force them to, the scores to be that way. What happens though is that the first dimension, it estimates a score uh, or an ideology on the dimension of the uh, the the, uh, the highest conflict within Congress, and this happens just to be a, a conservative liberal. That, that's that's what kind of separates. Um, the parties and it separates uh, legislators. You could imagine a case where something else, say, you know, civil war era is a regional d difference. You know, north versus south, not left wing versus right wing. Um, I'm pretty sure around the time of the civil war that that these scores, the first dimension, would have captured north versus south, um, not a conservative versus liberal uh, dimension. Um, a, a, a liberal versus conservative conflict. Um, okay. Um, now, um, the, we usually talk about the first dimensional score, okay? Sometimes we talk about a second dimensional score, and what that is is uh, Poole and Rosenthal interpret this as a racial dimension. So this kind of captures your preferences on affirmative action, on civil rights, and so on. Um, and what it best captures, it, it turns out, though, that this, uh, after like the early 90s, the second dimension really didn't add much in terms of of predicting votes, and so people didn't use them as much. They, they said the first dimension actually started predicting well civil rights issues and affirmative action issues after the late 90s, so you, the, the second dimension is not as important. Where, where they were important was things like in the 60s, late 70s, you'd have these people, um, these um Southern Democrats, uh, like Sam Irvin was one, um, who was a senator from North Carolina, was a, a 
liberal on a lot of economic issues, but on civil rights issues, uh, we, I think we'd call him conservative, was against affirmative action, um, uh, things like that. And so um, um, he was not voting with the Northern Democrats on these civil rights issues. And so he, the, the one dimension does it wouldn't capture his ideology very well. So you, the, the, for him, he needed this second dimension. And so he'd be liberal on the, the conservative, on the, on the um, economic issues, but um, he, he would be what you might call conservative on the civil rights issues. Um, okay. There were fewer people like Sam Irvin after the late 90s or even early 90s, so that's why they say the second dimension isn't as important. Okay. That's a brief overview, okay, what's going on with nominate scores. It's, it's just these numbers that express the ideology of legislators. Now, they also have cut points, which express the cut point, the, the point that would separate the yay and nay voters on any given roll call, that would best, that, that best separates them. Turns out the, the cut points usually do not perfectly separate them. Uh, it's only a, a way to separate, you know, such that of the people on one side of the cut point, 90% vote the way they're predicted, and same thing on the other side. Okay, we'll learn more about that as, as we go on. Okay, but the, fir the first thing to know is that the, 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 the nominate scores is just a, a measure of ideology. Okay, um, now despite the fact that we say the first mention re uh, represents liberal versus conservative, as I said, the scores do not force them to be that way. And in fact, the first thing to know about nominate scores is I'd ask you if I were in person, I'd say, what is the data? What data do Poole and Rosenthal use? Hope you pause and come back. The, the answer is the data is only the yay and nay votes of all the legislators. So this is what their, their data set looks like. It's something like a uh, legislator, and they'll have an ID, so the legislator one, two, three, four, five, so on. And then they'll have um, roll calls. And uh, about any given year uh, in the House, say there's like a thousand roll call votes. So um, it'll be roll call vote one, two, three, so on. And Poole and Rosenthal's data set will look like this. It's just a bunch of zeros and ones for how these legislators vote, yay or nay. So that's it, okay? So some people will say, yeah, but how come, you know, they reflect ideology. Poole and Rosenthal do not look at the substance of any bill. They do nothing to say this is the, lib the yay vote is the, yay the liberal side, nay vote is the conservative side, okay? There's nothing in that. All they do, y you could say, well, if they already have, sc have the scores, ideology, you see the people with the high scores voting yay and the low scores voting nay, from that they could conclude that, oh, it looks like the yay side is the conservative side, the nay vote is the, the liberal side, but it has nothing to do with the substance of the bill. Okay. <clears throat> Second, here's kind of a brief overview of, of what's going on with, with nominate scores. Um, okay, so I said there's a first dimension, there's a second dimension. Now, it turns out, in theory, you could have a third dimension nominate score, fourth dimension nominate score. What happens is um, nominate, uh, it's a computer program that spits out these scores. If you run the, the program, okay, now I think it's even programmed in R. Originally, it was a big Fortran program. Um, so if you go to Keith Poole's website, VoteView, I think it's VoteView.com, um, I'm almost certain you can download the, the R programs. I think you can download the Fortran programs. <clears throat> if you did that, you would have to feed the program the data. I think you can get it from Keith Poole's website. So the, the zeros and ones, the yays and nay votes of, of whatever legislature you're looking at, um, uh, uh, so you, you have to feed that, that data, and then the program will also ask you 
how many dimensions do you want to estimate? So you want to say, like, how many dimensions of conflict are there in the legislature that I'm looking at? So if we're looking at Congress, say, after the, the mid-'90s, really one that does a really good job. We think, really, it's just conservative versus liberals. You, you don't really need two dimensions, or much less three or four or five, to try to describe the conflict that's going on. So in, in latter, in modern day Congresses, what you might do in the, when that program asks you, you'd say, what, how many dimensions? You might say one. Okay. But on the other hand, if instead you said two, what the program would do is it would say, okay, let's try to create two dimensions and give scores on these two dimensions to try to estimate, to best explain these votes. The more dimensions you give, it can, it, it, well, I was going to say, it necessarily does better at predicting votes. That's not quite true. It could maybe tie, could do maybe just as well, but it will never do worse. So it's like you have more degrees of freedom. So um, more dimensions in general will help you predict the votes better. Um, but on the other hand, it gets more complicated. That's the trade off. But um, so for now, let's say that you had that program and you told it, I want to estimate one dimension, okay? What the program would do is, is something like the following. Uh, it might even ask you seed values, but uh, I'm not sure. I don't even think you have to do that. I, th I think it might even randomly start assigning seed values. So what it, what it would do is to say, well, we have this dimension, and it, it usually, at least in the, the early versions of Nominate, would normalize everything so that everyone's score had to be between negative one and one. What the program might do is say, okay, what are the who are the legislators? Let's for seed values. Let's start randomly assigning uh, ideal points on the scale. So they might say, legislator one is here, two is here, three is here, four is here, five is here, six is here, something like that. Okay. Then, um, let's see, that's, that's from negative 1.0. And then what it might do is it would say, well, okay, on the first roll call vote, suppose we saw that um, the legislators voted something like this. Um, and what nominate would do is it would say, well, what, Cut, where's a cut point that would help to um, predict the way people would vote? And let's say, well, it might look this. It might cut point one. That might be a good cut point. And they would say, here's the cut point. Everyone on the right tended to vote yes. Everyone on the left tended to vote nay. There's one guy we didn't predict very well, but C1 um, might be a good cut point, uh, good estimate of a cut point. Um and then what it might do, um, let's say we only had one roll call vote. Um, what it might do after that is say, um, well, no, no, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's say um, we had another case where these two voted yay, everyone else voted nay. So you'd say, well... A good estimate of the cut point of the second one is right here. Okay. So given that um, we have these next, what nominate might do is to say, well, okay, we had these guesses of the ideal points. Then from those guesses, we did an estimate of where cut points might be. We say, well, given those cut points, maybe we can get a better guess or better estimate of what ideal points might be. And so you might say, well, legislators four and three both voted on the conservative side. So it makes sense to give them an ideal point, something like that, three and four. Now, meanwhile... Um, which legislators uh, voted, uh, split their vote? Six and one did. So it would say something like, well, it makes sense to say 
six and one are somewhere in between. Their ideal points are somewhere in between C1 and C2. Meanwhile, there are two legislators, Legislator 2 and Legislator 5, who, all, who voted nay on both sides. By the way, it just happened that that the yay side tended to be the ones that were conservative. So on this one, the, 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 that's the other thing, that nominate would define the direction and say yay indicated conservative on this, this case. But the, regardless, it would say, well, now given these cut points, a good guess of, of uh, estimate of the ideal points of two and five would be something like here. Okay. So that's what it would do. And then it might it, uh, run this again and say, well, given these ideal points, you know, two and five are here, six and one in here, you know, can we do better guesses at where the cut points should be? We might readjust where those are. Then we might try to, re to again see where these ideal points might be. Okay. There's a series of rocking back. That's what nominate does. But the key thing is that we didn't look at the, the substance of the bills. All we did is just looked at the votes and tried to put these legislators along this line, give them scores along this line to say what their, their ideology is. Okay, That's what's going on. Okay, Now, um, what nominate does, and I just had two roll call votes for this example. You might imagine it where you know there's a thousand roll call votes, and you could see where some cases where you know we'd have cases where the cut point doesn't perfectly predict votes. As a consequence, you might want to say, well, there's another dimension of conflict, and that they everyone has an ideal point in this two dimensional space, and on this two dimensional space, rather than a cut point, we would have. A cut line that would try to separate votes. Okay, so that and that's what you would do in the two-dimensional case. Okay, so but here I've just so far I've only illustrated the, the one-dimensional case. Okay, so I hope I've given a, a little bit a taste, so you have just a, a, a kind of an idea of what's going on with nominate. Okay, so that I think this is five point eight. Um, yeah, it was 5.8. So in 5.9, I'm going to give a, a little bit of the math and actually explain a little bit about how Poole and Rosenthal create a likelihood function that uh, helps to estimate um, their ideal points. Okay, see you there in, in 5.9.